Thank you everyone for joining our webinar. My name is Lucia Starbuck and I'm the political reporter for KUNR Public Radio. Last year, I received a national fellowship, community engagement grant and mentorship from the USC Annenberg Center for Health Journalism. And I produced a four part series on rural maternal health care and the role doulas can play. Um, according to the March of Dimes, more than half of Nevada counties do not have a hospital that provides routine labor and delivery and, was a, and is without an OBGYN. So the first story in my series looks at the impacts and the barriers to care for for parents who live in community in, who for parents who live in maternity health care deserts, all of which are in rural communities here in Nevada. The second story looks at the patchwork of care for rural communities. When you're many, many miles away from the nearest hospital, sometimes rural EMS like an ambulance crew are responding to those calls or healthcare providers travel to these communities to provide prenatal services. The third story is all about the work doulas do. So from taking Spanish lessons to better communicate with their clients, shadowing healthcare workers at Renown and getting enrolled in Nevada Medicaid. And the last story takes a closer look at the unique role Role that rural doulas play and the support they provide for expectant parents in rural Nevada who have to travel to access health care. Um, so where do we go from here? Today, I'm super excited to be joined by a state lawmaker, doula, and doctor to further the conversation about solutions to improve access to maternal health care, particularly in rural Nevada. So I'll give a short introduction of our panelists. Dr. Catherine McCarthy is a family physician and family medicine professor with the UNR School of Medicine. For the last 20 years, she has made the one hour trip from Reno to Urington once a month to provide women's health care services. Natalie Doyen is a childbirth and postpartum doula and childbirth educator. She cares for expectant parents in Fallon, where she's based, and also in Fernley, Carson City, and Reno, most of whom are military service members. And Assemblywoman Chandra Summers Armstrong represents District 6 in Las Vegas. She sponsored two pieces of legislation. In 2021, she helped make it so doulas can get reimbursed by Medicaid. And during last year's session, that rate was tripled. Um, thank you so much for being here with me. Um, for our listeners, if you have questions during the event or comments or want to share what you liked about the series or what you thought, uh, please put your questions in the chat. We'll be getting to as many as we have time for at the end. All right, so now we'll head into our Q&A. All right, Dr. McCarthy, you travel from Reno to Urington to provide women's health services. To start, uh, tell us about the work you do in rural Nevada and your monthly clinic at the South Line Medical Center. Right. Well, for about 24 years now, I've been taking a trip to Urington from Reno um, once a month, so about a 90-minute drive each way. Um, I'm generally accompanied by a family medicine resident and a medical student, usually third year medical student. Um, and we go down and take care of mostly women and children. Um, we do prenatal care and also postpartum care, um, women's health care, reproductive health planning, um, et cetera. We tend to have a pretty big schedule on most days. Um, over the years, we've garnered a lot of continuity down there in that small community. Um, as far as taking care of families, sometimes through multiple pregnancies, um, and provide, I think, a pretty um, pretty important role in establishing risk for families that are embarking upon pregnancy who might not otherwise get prenatal care and who otherwise, without prenatal care, present to often Renown or Carson or Fallon um, as inherently high-risk patients because they haven't had any of their risk factors established in their early prenatal course. And I know you've talked about that continuity of care, you know, caring sometimes for a mom and then her daughter as she grows up and her sisters. So that's really neat that you get to see almost the whole family. Um, why is it crucial for you to go to Urington once a month? Uh, what do you hear from your patients? You know, there's, there's a few things I think for, um, women and families in general in rural communities, it can be really hard to make that commute out of the rurals, right, for a multitude of reasons. So a lot of our patients don't have good access to transportation. So perhaps, you know, gas money is a problem or a running car is a problem or, you know, maybe getting off of work is a problem. Um, you know, sometimes patients don't have driver's licenses. So there's a lot of reasons 
that people might not travel or it might not be convenient for them to travel often. And during pregnancy, we like to see people on a regular schedule, right, um, as they're going through. So even just making it easier for them to have less trips to Reno can be very helpful for the families. But some families might not have any trips prior to their delivery. So it can really help as far as making sure that they have all of their health assessments, you know, labs done and ultrasounds, et cetera. Um, Dr. McCarthy, as you mentioned, when you go to these monthly clinics, you're typically joined by a resident and a medical student. Uh, why is that important? What do you hope that they can get out of this experience? So I've been involved in teaching at the medical school for the last 20 or so years, and I have um, a real love for rural health care and rural communities. Um, I'm an advocate for primary care in any setting and primary care in general in Nevada being so important um, with our health indicators being um, so far skewed as far as number of providers that we have to our population. Um, so we really have a passion for trying to show our students and residents what practicing medicine in a rural location is like. And if they don't have that experience, they don't know. And they're not able to develop that passion themselves or realize that they might have an interest. So I think that the experience for the students and residents to go into the rurals is very rich. Um, are there some success stories you can share with us about um, getting more providers in rural communities? You know, it's it's um, always considered a big win for us if we get one of our graduates to go into rural Nevada. Unfortunately, we don't have many training programs right now in the rurals, and that's that's a whole nother issue of GME of funding, basically. Um, so you may know one of our current state senators, Dr. Robin Titus, was in practice in Smith Valley. Nevada, so about 30 miles from Yerington. Uh, she was the only doctor there for almost 40 years, was a graduate of our Reno Medical School and Family Medicine Residency. Um, she moved on to the assembly several years ago, and um, one of our graduates actually took over her practice down in Smith Valley. So for this small community there, they really lucked out because it was going to be a tremendous loss for them to lose their one physician provider, right? She was the only physician within 35 miles for almost 40 years. So one of our graduates took over her practice and I just am so grateful for him and um, how lucky the community is to have another likely lifelong physician practicing in their community. Um, you mentioned you've been doing this for 24 years, this monthly clinic. Um, what needs to be done to make sure your shoes are filled someday? Well, we always have junior faculty coming up through the ranks. So uh, I don't know if Dr. Ashley Jones is on this call yet, but she's one of our new OB faculty and dedicated women's um, health faculty. So hopefully she'll have the desire to take over the clinic as well. Um, what are some other programs you think that can help encourage get to get more providers out in rural communities? You know, the medical training is what we need. So um, it's been up in front of the legislature to in increase the funding for graduate medical education or GME. So we know that we have a huge shortage of primary care providers in the state and specialty providers, physicians in general, and nurse practitioners, PAs in general. Um, and we need funding so that more of our medical school graduates can stay in the state to do their residency training and their postgraduate training. Um, we know that many doctors, once they relocate for their training, end up practicing where they relocate. So it's really important to try to keep these physicians in Nevada. Um, right now, we don't have any teaching health centers um, in Nevada. So it's really an issue of funding and money to increase training programs here in our state and to make opportunities also in the rural communities. Um, we have one residency slot currently in Winnemucca, and it's actually run through UNLV, and we have two trainees there. So, you know, if we can increase those numbers and increase the number of communities and the presence in the state, we will have much more success keeping those doctors, not just in state, but also in some of the rural locations. What's unique about providing rural health care versus urban health care? Well, you know, you have a lot less resources. Um, you have a lot less satisf a lot a lot more satisfaction and also appreciation 
from the patient population, but you really know that you're doing a difference. And there's such a sense of community and that can't be overstated. I mean, even in our family medicine practice at the medical school, we have a large community there, right? And patients that have been coming for years. But when you're in a rural setting and you're in a town of maybe 3,000 or 5,000, you know, you're really in a community where you have taken care of women and children and grandparents and neighbors, and you have a very intricate woven fabric of community there to care for. And that's very rewarding. What do your conversations look like with your uh, residents and students who, who go out with you to the rural clinics? You know, they're usually very surprised by what they learn and what they experience. Um, and I'm going to speak of Yarrington specifically. Um, they get to really see what resources are available and what resources aren't available. And that can be quite eye-opening for them. And then for them to get the opportunity to speak to each of the patients individually to learn their stories and sometimes to continue their care when they come to Reno. So many of our pregnant patients, as they progress through pregnancy, are then assigned to one of our physicians in Reno, one of our resident physicians, to go through the labor and delivery process together. So that can be quite a continuity relationship and bond that's formed between those as they go through. And then often they'll be involved in the postpartum care and sometimes also the care of the baby, the newborn and such going on. So many of our residents throughout their three or four years of training get to make the Yarrington trip several times. Um, and because some of our students stay on in our program, sometimes they've even come down as students. So I have residents who have made the trip down there with me, you know, half a dozen times sometimes. Um, are there any other locations where you think um, a traveling provider would uh, would benefit from? You name it. <laughs> right. I mean, up here, gosh, what do we think of? It's such a shortage now. Tonopah is a big one, right? They lost their... Um, hospital there. But yeah, pretty much you get 90 miles or so outside of Reno and you're into, um, and I'm just speaking of the North, of course, because the state is really mirrored North and South as far as um, lack of access to care and lack of medical professionals in those areas. And are there any other solutions you want to see to improve access to rural maternal health care? You know, I think in general, we really need to have more doctors in the state, more PAs, more nurse practitioners, more midwives, more doulas, anyone who supports um, this cause of care and maternity care being, um, you know, especially important to all of us on this call. Um, how can the community support the work you do, Dr. McCarthy? I'd say speak to your legislators. <laughs> Right. Here's a shout out. Speak to your legislators. Be involved. Um, advocate. Advocate for your state and for medical care and access to resources in the state. Um, if you're interested in maternal mortality or access to care, those are really important things to make your voice heard. Thank you so much, Dr. McCarthy. Um, next, we'll go to Natalie. Natalie, um, you're a childbirth and postpartum doula and childbirth educator. Um, first, tell us, what does a doula do? So first of all, thank you for facilitating this conversation for all of us and getting it out there. Um, this topic could not be more important. Um, doulas, so we provide physical and emotional support throughout the mom's pregnancy, her birth and her postpartum period, um, starting with prenatal appointments to get to know the mom, her birthing wishes, um, what her preference are for labor, and also, you know, where she's choosing to birth, where she wants to have her baby. Um, we start again with education. What does birth look like? So from the ground up, what are the signs of labor? Um, how do we take care of our bodies when we're pregnant and growing babies? How do we take care of our um, mental states, you know, as we're going through the process too? Um, and then creating a birth preference sheet so that everybody on the care team has a very clear idea of what her um, wishes are. Um, and then it ends with the postpartum after birth. You know, we're advocating throughout that birth with the team of what she wants, how she wants things to look and go. Um, sometimes there's hiccups along the way. So we're, you know, a lot of times pulling out evidence based research um, to help her to help guide her through the process. 
Um, and then the postpartum period, we typically come in home. Um, we support with daily tasks like laundry, um, tidying up the kitchen, holding the baby so mama can nap, making little snacks, you know, just to keep her uh, moving in the right direction. We also will do like newborn basics, uh, first baths, because those can be a little intimidating. And then we do breastfeeding support as well. Um, doulas have, they've done a, in 2017, there was a Cochrane review done um, and how doulas support moms. And the review was huge with their findings. You know, there's a 39% decrease in the risk of a cesarean when you have a doula by your side. And I really think it's because we slow the process of birth down and we educate our families throughout the whole, um, from start to finish. They have a great um, knowledge base of where, where they're starting and where they're going. You know, there's a 15% increase in spontaneous vaginal birth. Well, why? It's because we're telling our moms, what are the indicators of labor? Um, we're educating them on how to recognize labor signs versus maybe making a choice for an induction, um, which puts them at a little bit dicey or, or increased risks. Um, there's 10% decreases in the use of medication um, for pain relief. It's because we're loving on our moms. We're doing hip squeeze and counter pressure and all of the tools that come with a doula to keep her good and comfortable throughout the laboring process, as well as keeping those emotions down and really kind of bringing her back to where she can turn inwards and trust her body rather than um, using unnecessary interventions um, around her. This also helps with the babies. The babies have a 38% decrease um, of a lower five minute APGAR score. And that's because mom's not stressed when doulas are present and babies don't get stressed. So we really work together, um, not just with the mama, but also with that little baby and keeping them um, satisfied inside the womb throughout the birthing process. That's amazing. Um, <clears throat> many of your uh, family, the families you work with uh, travel an hour to give birth in Reno. Um, what does, what does your role look like as a rural doula and what do your conversations look like with those parents? Sure. So as a rural doula, um, I provide information to the moms on their birthing options by understanding protocol and procedures and being a small community and getting to know um, the, what we, our resources here locally are, and then also traveling to the different hospitals, Carson, Tahoe, Renown, Northern Nevada, working with midwives. Um, I get a really good understanding of the different providers and how they like to care for moms. And so I'm really that first resource of um, a mom like getting online and saying, oh, I'm pregnant and I don't know where to go or who's going to align with my birth preferences. And so um, we have that first initial conversation of what do you want your birth to look like? And then I can kind of pull from my knowledge base of um, who I've worked with, where I've worked before, what their procedures are and say, you know, this might be a good fit, or I can inform them on the different varieties of birth um, that are options for them. So really educating them on their, their birth setting and helping them advocate for what they want. Um, and then she ultimately chooses, you know, do her birth preferences align with our local facility here, or would she prefer to deliver at home? Um, with a midwife, or is she going to choose a different facility? If um, if I'm supporting a mother that's chosen to travel for birth to Reno or Carson, we discuss the risks and benefits, um, recognizing signs of labor clearly so that they aren't turned away, you know, for arriving too early or leaving their homes too late, um, because there can be kind of um, it can be a little bit frustrating to, to drive an hour just to hear, well, you're not quite there yet. So go home, rest, and let's see if we can't get you into active labor. So I really like to start educating mamas on how to understand their body and when they are truly ready to go into the hospital. You know, bringing them there too early sometimes can increase our intervention risks. So really kind of nailing that, you know, what, when do we leave? Um, and I think it says a lot for a mom to choose to take that chance because she's not only um, taking the drive time into consideration, but weather conditions, um, traffic, you never know what's going to happen on the interstate. Um, but to still choose to birth an hour away says, says a lot. 
Um, and then babies typically give us plenty of time to recognize when labor's starting. So it's still, a, there is still that risk there, um, but we kind of have some, some little tools and tricks to know, like, yeah, it's probably time to get moving. Um, tell us about your experience working in the hospital setting and with uh, traditional healthcare providers. How, how can we uh, create harmony between the two professions for you guys both want the same outcome? Um, so how can uh, doulas and doctors work, work together? Sure. So I think creating space for all birth workers to consult on patient care plans without any fear of retaliation, um, removing that gray zone, you know, me walking into a hospital and knowing, you know, what, what the provider expects of me, um, what the provider expects of the birthing mother, and then us working as a team. So having a space where we can go over her birth preferences and, you know, Discuss, having a good conversation. So everybody feels really calm moving forwards and everyone's on the same page of the mom's wishes. Um, respect for both parties and their knowledge in the field. You know, as a doula, all we do is study the latest and greatest materials, um, evidence-based birth. We want to know, we want to be on top of, of what we are presenting to our clients because we care about their birth stories and we want them to have a positive one. So giving them, you know, the best, most up-to-date information means that we're typically at home in the evenings geeking out over birth knowledge and podcasts and listening and um, reading case studies because we just really want to give them 100% um, the best, most up-to-date uh, positions, movements, comfort measures, interventions. Um, and then having tools in these hospitals. So, you know, showing up to the hospital and having all of the varieties of peanut balls will enhance that mother's experience, you know, birth balls in every single room, things that have been proven to work help and help the mom and her comfort and progressing labor, having those at your fingertips, instead of me hauling in my van, all of my different things that I have here, just having them accessible to these mamas. And then Regular checkups, ultimately, I think, between the teams to discuss concerns and possibly doing policy updates, you know, maybe you're having a great um, relationship working with a provider and, you know, they want to invite you into the OR like we have at the doula access program in Renown, you know, I have access um, from doing their different shadowing shifts with the nurses, I have access now to the L and D floor, the OR room, the postpartum units. That is critical because sometimes birth doesn't go as expected and moms are faced with C-sections. Well, they want someone there that is going to love them, support them, and knows that um, their doula aligns with what their wishes are. So having that person to walk them through a C-section can be huge in, in reducing birth trauma. Um, I just think that being able to have a conversation between between experts um, and recognizing that there is a space for everybody um, and that we all provide different types of care and it all if it if it all comes together, then we can we can just make that mom's experience much better. And Natalie, you're also enrolled in Medicaid and Tricare, the military insurance. Uh, what kind of difference does it make to be covered under insurance? Um, well, I think it says a lot that our government agencies are recognizing the benefits of doula work and having a doula present at the um, at the birth for that mama. Um, statistics show that with doula support, you're at a 31% decrease of a negative birth experience. And that's because we're holding space for the mom. We're recognizing the work she's doing. We're understanding the process she's going through. And sometimes it doesn't mean, you know, tons of... Um, flips and turns and things. Sometimes it's just sitting there with your hand on her hand. Um, and insurance is starting to, Medicaid and TRICARE, they're starting to understand that, you know, if we're not, if the moms are happy and they're less stressed, then they're at a, at a decrease for that C-section, um, which are more costly. Um, so they're not paying these huge bills for C-sections. They're not paying the, the hospitals for um, endless C-sections. They're instead paying doula support, which is a fraction of the cost. And these moms are walking away feeling fully supported by a great birth team. 
Um, I really believe that our at-risk mothers are Medicaid and TRICARE clients. Um, personally, as a military spouse of 15 years, I have three kids and two of them were birthed without my partner there um, because of deployment, because of COVID. Um, we are birthing, we are military fam families birthing without support. And so to not have someone there that you can trust um, and that loves you or um, cares about your birth experience can be kind of frightening, um, especially in the postpartum period. You know, we get discharged from the hospital and we bring home this new baby and we're bonding, but we don't know, you know, what does postpartum look like? How, how do we take care of ourselves where we used to be um, a tribe that would circle around our moms? Now we're doing it alone and we're telling our mothers that they need to do it alone and quickly and get right back to work. And that mentality is just not good for facilitating um, family bonding. So postpartum doulas coming to the house um, and, and being able to take care of moms and kind of tell them, yeah, this is normal. This is, you know, the baby blues, let's cry together and have some support there, I think is, is really important. And our insurance companies are recognizing that. And what other solutions do you want to see um, in rural Nevada to improve access to maternal health care? Um, I would love to see wellness centers for in all communities for doulas to have access to. It is huge for me to, I just um, opened a childbirth education room in our pregnancy center here locally. Um, and so I can meet with clients there. I'm not, I'm no longer driving to homes um, or driving into the desert to meet with families instead for their prenatals. They're, we're all able to come to this one space and use and have everything right there. Um, so I think wellness centers opening up and being um, accessible to doulas and to clients would be fantastic. And then, you know, streamline that insurance process. That can be a beast. It is not easy to navigate alone. And so um, making it easier, taking the guesswork out of the claims process, you know, support the doulas, help us out. We, we are not claims experts. Um, that is not where our gifts lie. Um, so streamline that process, help us out. Um, and then supporting midwives and maternity care, um, more OBs, more, more midwives, more um, conversations like this. This is just only positive can come from it. Um, and then the increase in the reimbursement rates to a livable wage. You know, a lot of us are single moms um, trying to take care of families. Um, and it's hard to, you have to fit in so many births just to, just to survive. And, um, sometimes that can affect your quality of care. So let's raise that. So we're taking, we're putting more, um, concentrated care on, on families. And we're also able to take care of our own families in the end as well. Thank you so much, Natalie, for all the work you do. Um, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong, you just heard from a doula and a doctor serving rural communities here in Nevada. Um, you're not running for re-election um, for a state assembly as you're now running for Las Vegas City Council, but are there any steps the state can take to address um, some of the issues raised today? Well, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Chandra Summers Armstrong, and I am just blessed to be here. This is an amazing conversation. Thank you so much, Lucia, for reaching out. Um, I think that there that we have a two-pronged thing. I, th I think um, most of the funding and reimbursement rates, of course, are um, you know from the feds and then through the state. And there are some things that we can do about that uh, from a legislative perspective, which is what we did um, in uh, Assembly District, uh, in the legislature in 2021 when we passed uh, AB 256, which was the first time ever that we have had legislation passed that allows doulas to be covered uh, their services under Medicare. Um, it didn't pay enough, we, we know that, but um, the organization that supported me in doing this, Make It Work Nevada, they had a dream and they felt that this was uh, the way to begin and that's where we, be and that's where we were at um, AB 256. Uh, in 2023, just last year, uh, we came back to the table at the legislature and, and the, the idea there was to increase the reimbursement rate uh, to something more in keeping with the work that is being done. Um, it is amazing to me that so much of the work that women do, um, birth work, uh, in-home care, all those things that keep our families together, 
just don't are not paid well. Um, and I think that we have to have a reckoning with ourselves um, as a state and a country on why we don't pay women to do the kinds of care that keep our families from falling apart, right? Um, people ask me, you know, how did you get into this? Why doulas? What the heck is a doula? Um, I was a military wife, just like Natalie. I spent um, almost 10 years married to the Air Force and uh, spent four years in Northern Germany. And if anyone who's in the service knows, there are not a lot of military installations in the North um, of the country at that time. Um, and we were at a forward operating location, which basically means there's no support, there's no base or anything. And I had to make a decision whether I was going to have my babies at a military installation, which at the time from the little town of Alhorn where I lived was a two and a half hour drive to Bremerhaven, the only military hospital in the area, or to have the baby on the economy, which means to go to a local uh, German doctor. And I chose to have my baby locally. And what came with that was a midwife. I had never experienced, I had never had a baby. My family wasn't there. My mom's in California, no one came over. And that midwife, uh, a birth worker who are highly respected in, in Germany, held my hand through two births. Um, I stayed in the hospital. Uh, she came to my home before I had the babies to look at the environment and make sure that I understood about swaddling and and um, comforting and relieving gas and, and all those things. And then like Natalie was saying that postpartum, you get that baby, you get home, what the heck are you gonna do? And the first child we had, my oldest son, Brandon, sure enough, we come home from the, 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 um, the hospital and within 20 minutes, my doorbell's ringing. And who is it? It's my midwife, Frau Busa. She comes in like a storm. And, and she must have, I don't know who told her, but I was i was nuts. My baby had, you know, the blowout, the come home from the hospital blowout up and down the back. It was a disaster. I was freaked out. And here is this woman as cool and calm as can be. And she told me, just move over. I got it and handled things and got me in the bed and the baby nice and clean and swaddled. It's like it was yesterday. It's so important. Giving birth is so complicated and so emotional. And what a woman doesn't need is to be um, by herself. And she doesn't need to be um, abandoned because this is the beginning of how our children are gonna see life. And if we don't give them an experience, the mother, and the child and experience that is going to be uplifting and wholesome and just loving, that stress is going to carry on to the child. Sorry, guys, I'm a big crier, sorry. Um, and so when Make It Work Nevada said, hey, will you carry this? And I began to remember what that was like for me. I could do nothing but say yes. And in 23, we had to fight really in a very legislative way to get this increase. People were against it. We had medical professionals that were afraid of this increase and what that would do to their ability to be reimbursed. And so it is important that we know that how we bring children into this world and how we come around them is indicative of what we're gonna see five, 10, 15 years down the line so if we have the power and we have the energy, let's fight for a good policy that's going to ensure that our children have a great experience coming into the world and that the moms have a great experience bringing that child into the world and that we value the work of people who work in this space. Thank you for being so vulnerable with this assembly woman. I know every mom I interviewed for this series could just recount in details their, their birth story. And like, like you said, like it was yesterday. So you're, you're not alone there. Um, uh, doulas are just, just one piece of the puzzle. What else uh, can the state legislature do to improve access to maternal health care? Well, I think um, 
they, there's something called the Black Maternal uh, Omnibus Bill that's on a federal level. And um, there are some things in, in that suggested things that they would like to see that I think that we should be looking at um, in Nevada. Um, first of all, you know, as Dr. McCarthy said, we need more, more doctors and we need to find a way um, to keep them here. Um, and, you know, we pay for everything else. I, I don't understand why, um, you know, we shouldn't think about the value of helping those doctors if we want them to stay here uh, with their tuition or their fees or whatever to le lessen their burden um, uh, their financial burden so that they'll stay here. I think that's really, really important. Um, and another thing that I think is really important is how do we train up the next generation of doulas and midwives um, to help support in the interim, right? Because becoming a doctor takes a much, much longer um, and we can't control whether or not they're going to stay. But we have women in the state who are interested in this so to me, I believe it is important that we um, provide a living wage for this and even some money for training. Um, one of the things that um, Natalie said earlier um, uh, was um, making sure that there's everybody can come to the table who are part of this, right? That doulas and midwives and doctors are all on the same page. Um, when we were going through these bills, I worked with Emily Barney and the folks with the doula project in Carson City and the folks at Make It Work down here in Southern Nevada. And um, we've been talking since the bills have passed about what we can do. And so we've had conversations with um, MCOs um, and talking about how do we get access for training this is a, could be a career path, right? So we are training women to be um, self-sustaining. This could also be an opportunity, um, Natalie talked about the billing process. Um, one of the big MCOs um, is trying to ramp up their doula program and they're gonna hire a big company out of state to come in and do billing. But one of my doulas, uh, Jolena said, well, why can't we make this um, a uh, Jolena Simpson um, uh, she is with the uh, Birth Collaborative in Las Vegas, you know, said to me, why can't we talk about this being a career path, training women or people, anyone who's interested, how to bill so that the doulas can have support and they don't have to worry about being a billing expert, right? So um, I've talked to city council people about this. People are interested and how we can make this a career path, how we can expand and diversify um, our medical practice and, and, and bring jobs into communities so that if a mom wants to be a doula, she can. And then another mom could be a biller and now she's bringing in income for her family, right? And so I think these are things that we have to consider. And I think we also have to look at the uh, Black Maternal Health Momnibus Bill and look at some of the things that they're saying that are really, really important. And the one that speaks to me the most as a le legislator who represents a community that um, has some areas that really suffer from disinvestment and, um, and, and just all kinds of stuff is the, um, the determinants of health, the social determinants of health outcomes and get that information and be honest about it and collect it. We have housing challenges in this state where we have folks who can't afford housing and transportation. Um, uh, Natalie and Catherine were talking about moms having to drive an hour or two to get where, well, if you live in an urban area and you live in a place like historic West Las Vegas that doesn't, that only one in two people have a vehicle, we need transportation to get to the doctor, right? A lot of these folks are riding the bus to get to the doctor. And if it takes you three buses to get where you need to go, how is that helping? And one of the biggest issues that we have in urban communities is access to healthy food and nutrition. And I think that uh, these two ladies on here will tell you that when moms are not eating well, when they don't have the kind of support that they need as far as fresh food and understanding how to cook it um, and serve it to their families, we see issues down the road, 
right? And and all of these things are, are part of whether or not we are serious as community leaders, as legislators, as elected officials. If we are not talking about this whole continuum of care and all the things that go into it, then we're not serious because all of these things matter when it comes to healthy moms, healthy babies who grow up to be healthy humans. Wow, it seems like there are a lot of similarities between Las Vegas and the rural communities, uh, all of us here in Nevada. Um, any other solutions that you, you've seen elsewhere or that you'd like to see here? I will tell you that um, I saw a documentary uh, recently about um, Martin Luther King Hospital in uh, Los Angeles, which uh, had a horrible reputation um, and had high uh, rates of maternal death and just horrible stuff. And if you all have access, um, please go out and look for the for the documentary. And it talked about this huge shift they made in how they deal with birthing moms. Um, they deal with it mostly with um, nurses and uh, who have been specially trained um, in birthing and doulas, and they allow the doulas in. And they have, as you were talking about, Natalie, all the equipment, the, the balls and the peanuts, and the mom doesn't have to stay strapped to the bed. Um, and they allow that mom to choose how she wants to birth that baby in conjunction with, of course, what is safe, but with her doula and her midwife. And the doctor is there when needed. When I had my two sons uh, in Germany, the doctor never touched me. Frau Busse was in charge. She was the boss. She bossed him around. She bossed my husband around at the time. She was the boss. It was all about me. I never felt like she wasn't hearing me. And Natalie spoke about calming the mom and making sure that we're not rushing, that you have time to go through the full process and not have to have a C-session. She handled it. And that was my experience. And I will carry that with me forever. And I think that this is just a, a, a time where we can reimagine what it means and, and how we have children. And it's up to us um, to push the issue. And so any of you out there who are in Nevada, please talk to your um, legislative leaders and your local leaders and, and talk to them about what you've heard today and push the issue. Nothing gets changed if we're quiet. The old folks used to say a closed mouth gets doesn't get fed. We have to move in a way that is um, forceful um, to make this change that we need both in our rural communities and in our urban communities that are basically healthcare and food deserts. Thank you so much, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong. Um, you just heard from uh, family physician Catherine McCarthy, doula Natalie Doyen, and Assemblywoman Sum Sandra, Chandra Summers Armstrong. Um, we'll now be getting to some of the questions posted in the chat. If you haven't already, please add yours. Um, I have a few for um, Natalie. Uh, first, can you kind of talk about uh, the training and certification that it takes to become a doula and if you're seeing any kind of uh, uh, support programs for people wanting to get into doula work, like a high school program or financial assistance? Oops, is it just muting and unmuting? Uh, my team, is there something on the administrative end where we can unmute Natalie? Yeah, I'm locked up. Oh, there we go. We can hear you now. Okay. Um, so it's, it's kind of tricky. There's several programs out there for training for for training doulas um, and the certification process. Um, and not all are created equally. So researching which programs are available. Um, and re also going into TRICARE and going into Medicaid and say, you know, which ones are they um, acknowledging as a good program that they will reimburse so you can become a Medicaid provider? Uh, right now, I know TRICARE covers like five different certifications, um, and I believe Medicaid's kind of the same. But I would say the all I can do is speak on my experience. I'm a DONA certified provider. 
Um, so my process was doing coursework. I had 27 different um, books that I had had to read. Um, and then once you complete your essay and your coursework, then you do um, like on the job training. So you have families that you have to support and you get a review from them. The providers that watched you attend that family will also give you a review. Um, and then you'll go through a board process. So you'll present you'll do all of your coursework, you'll read your materials, you'll write your essay, you'll support your families, and then you'll go to the board and present this package to them. Um, sometimes they have extra questions that they wanna ask you just to clarify you know, how everything went. And then from that point on, you can um, get your certification. And so I am internationally certified because I'm military and who knows where we're going next. We just came from Japan um, so that I can take my license with me. Uh, and then, I would love to see like mentorship programs because, you know, really to be a good, strong doula, you got to have experience. You need to, you need to cultivate relationships within your community. And the only way to do that is through networking uh, and teaming up with other doulas. So, you know, the co-op is a wonderful opportunity to get a wealth of knowledge uh, and resources. I can tell you at, at a at my fingertips, I can type, you know, who are pediatricians in our area that um, don't force vaccination? And I can get a resource list right there to provide to my family. So I think if you're wanting to become a doula, um, there are scholarships through the co-op that we're working on. Um, I We were out of pocket for, for ourselves, um, but it's truly, it's truly a, a work from the heart. And so if your heart is for serving other families and serving moms, it is worth it 100%. And Natalie, while I have you, um, what are some misconceptions, what are some common misconceptions about doulas? Probably that we're going to burn sage and chant around the room with our bras off or that we're these crazy eccentric women that, you know, don't understand physiological birth. Um, I like to... <laughs> I usually lead with that in a meeting because most of uh, the partners, are, they don't understand why their wife has presented them or their, their spouse has presented them with this option for their birth team. And so I'd like to really break it down that um, we are, we're not shooting from the hips. We are educated birth professionals that love to learn, love to study, love to have the latest and greatest information at our fingertips in order to create a good, positive birth experience for moms. That is the goal. We want everyone walking away happy, healthy, okay, ready to take on motherhood. From To go from maiden to motherhood is pivotal in your life. And just like Chandra had said, it's an emotional thing. It is Birth is something you will take with you for the rest of your life, whether it's good or bad. And so creating positive birth experiences it matters. Thank you, Natalie. And Dr. McCarthy, a question for you. Um, uh, do Nevada's med schools provide training for birth workers? And if not, are there med schools that do who we could learn from? Uh, you know, I can only speak to Reno and um, there is not a program there in Reno. I'm not um, educated as far as where the Nevada programs are, but I do see that you guys have a couple things in the chat um, about that. Uh, what about for supporting um, uh, students interested in becoming an OBGYN? Oh, certainly um, as far as mentorship there um, would be very strong. And I think that um, we I did hear um, Assemblywoman Summers Armstrong talk about her experience with a midwife. I did some training um, under midwives when I did some of my training in the UK, and we do have um, very active midwifery practice in Reno and at Renown. So my trainees in family medicine on labor and delivery get to work under the um, guidance of some nurse midwives. Um, and I shared my OB call for some time also with nurse midwives who work with our medical students, let them shadow, let them hang out in labor and delivery, you know, have a lot of time to spend with the families and teach them. And also we have more and more doula presence at Renown as well, and got to work with them as well a lot under our midwives. 
um, which is very educational and inspirational also for our learners, both students and resident physicians. Um, so that's a very um, rich patient care change that I've seen over the last couple of decades since I've been in Reno. So, um, and as I wrote in the chat, we know that there's just great evidence and support for having a doula or a birth partner or a nurse midwife, anyone who is able to go through the laboring process, the physiologic birth with the, with the family. And that postpartum support I wasn't aware of that you do, Natalie, and that you all do, which, you know, is, an, is a no-brainer, the importance of that um, and that we don't um, really attend to that in our country um, generally. So your role in that, um, kudos. I think that's super important. And um, for, for those on the call who might not be familiar, can you chat a little bit about the, you know, the difference between like a, a midwife and an, and an OBGYN, uh, Dr. McCarthy? Sure, absolutely. So um, there's different levels, um, different types of midwives. The ones that I'm talking about are the certified nurse midwives, and they are um, I'm also not an expert on this, so I don't want to overstep and Natalie might want to chime in with something here, but um, they are certified at the hospital to go through the labor and delivery process and provide standard low risk obstetrical care, right? So these are for patients that don't require an operative delivery or who don't have significant complications that arise during the delivery process, right? There's always backup um, and when I say backup, I mean mainly obstetrical or surgical backup when needed. But otherwise, the entire prenatal course can be handled by the certified nurse midwife. Um, and we have more and more access in Reno to those opportunities for patients. Um, and we were talking specifically about the Medicaid population um, availability there with that population as well. So it's a great resource. Um, and often you will have the same provider then taking you through your prenatal course and your delivery, which I'm a huge advocate of that continuity and not meeting someone for the first time at the time of your delivery. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. Um, Natalie, did you have anything to add? I, as far as the midwives, all I know is, you know, my experience working with them at Renown and then at these home births, I just adore them. I think they are experts when they are taking care of their mamas. And yeah, I, I agree 100%. Continuity of care is everything. Um, knowing who's surrounding a mother when she's birthing um, really helps her settle into the environment. And so to know that you're being taken care of by someone that you trust and supports your birth preferences is critical to, to your outcomes. And Natalie, a question I wanted to ask you too, um, uh, why is it important to have um, a doula or a provider locally in your own community? Because I believe we're a wealth of knowledge. I, I believe, you know, we know who's birthing. They're often my friends, my um, neighbors, my um, ladies in my groups. You know, it's, it's important to, to have someone that you can build trust with uh, that will hold your hand and walk through the birthing process with you. Take out that fear. Let's let's get educated. Let's learn about our bodies. Let's learn about the process so that when you show up and you're in roaring labor, you know exactly what you want. Your care provider knows exactly what you want. Um, I know that I work closely with our hospital here. And so they know who I, the doctors know who I am. I know who they are. Um, there's not a lot of... Um, not tons of unknowns, the nursing staff, you know, when they see me, they usually feel pretty comfortable with me um, disconnecting monitors and taking moms to the bathroom. It just frees them up. So, you know, we have four rooms here for delivery. And if all, if all four of those rooms are busy and we have two nurses on to support that, sometimes having a doula there to, to help clean up a space or to help take care of the mom, um, whether it's hydration or, going to the restroom, you know, it frees that nurse up to go do the things that she's needed to, to go do as well. Definitely. Um, to one of my panelists, um, anything I didn't ask that you guys would like to talk about? I'd like to just add a little bit about cultural competency. Mm -hmm. um, I think that um, just as in rural communities where you may know your neighbor, um, down in, in urban communities, um, you know, we know that we have a dearth of 
uh, black physicians, when we have a dearth of, um, of physicians of varied background. Um, a doula, if she's born and, and, and comes from the community, um, she can bridge that gap culturally between the doctor and, and the patient. Um, it's one thing for um, a person to come to the doctor's office or in a delivery situation and they're being asked to comply with something from a stranger than a doula who they've had a relationship with and who might also be able to help them comply in a manner that is um, that is makes them feel comfortable, right? Um, because they have a relationship or if things are not going the way they had hoped they would and they've got to change course, hearing that from that doula instead of what we hear often um, in our, um, especially in Medicaid spaces, um, where, um, and just in just in hospital spaces in general, um, and one of the things that um, the state of Nevada study showed us is that many people who are on Medicaid feel like doctors and professionals don't listen to them. And so this is one of the big problems that we have with black maternal health and the, the, the high instance of death is that the women have asked the doctor to hear or the nurse or whomever and in the hospital, people are busy and they, they don't hear. And this is where that doula comes in. She's the advocate, knows the lingo, has built relationships in those hospitals and can bridge that gap. And the hope and the prayer is that we will have fewer women dying. We will have fewer situations where babies are in distress and end up with issues later on and that families will have a good outcome. We have too many instances where uh, in my community of black women, they go to the hospital afraid whether or not they're gonna come out alive. And so this is why I, I roll for doulas. I, I roll for them un unabashedly. I don't care, I roll for them because I know what they do and I know what they bring and I know how much they care. And you don't do this work for $1,500 per birth and before that, it was even less if you just don't love this kind of work. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, thank, thank you um, to my panelists for this really informative conversation about improving access to rural maternal health care. It was really important for me to keep this conversation going and talk about solutions um, after my series published. I also want to give a huge thank you to Tina Apelles. Uh, she's my national community engagement um, editor with the USC Annenberg Center for Health Journalism. Uh, she made this event and we did a previous roundtable in Fallon um, possible. And I, I once again, I received a national fellowship community engagement grant and mentorship from the Center of Health Journalism to complete this project. And I just want to say a huge thank you to everyone who joined the webinar today, to our amazing panelists and all the work that you do, and everyone who, who supported me and, and gave me guidance and their thoughts uh, to help make this series come to life. Uh, we'll be posting the full video on our website. And if you want to revisit the series, The Long Road to Maternal Care, or share it with a friend, um, head to KUNR.org. Thank you, everyone.